Good morning, everyone. My name is Michelle Dixon Wall. I am with the Washington Coalition of Sexual Assault Programs. Um, I am coming to you live from Olympia, Washington in my house in my spare bedroom. There may or may not be dogs barking. Um, and I'm here to host um, trauma in the brain and body. I'm gonna be womaning the chat over here um, for any um, questions that you have or technological issues that come up. This webinar is being recorded. Um, so you can view it again later on. Um, and other people who weren't able to join us today can view it um, for the content. So just so you know, this will be recorded. Uh, your chat, uh, the chat box will not be recorded, but we do have interpreters with us today. So I will be reading them aloud when they're applicable to uh, the group. Um, if you just have regular questions for me, that's fine. But if you have something for the group, for uh, Jace, I'm gonna be reading those out loud. Uh, I'm so excited to introduce you all to um, my friend, Jace Starrett. Um, him and I work together um, as advocates um, doing sexual assault and domestic violence work um, for a number of years. We were co-trainers at our advocate core training that we did at our local program. Um, and before I was an advocate, I was a massage therapist and after Jace was an advocate, then he became a massage therapist. So we have mirror image kind of journeys. <laughs> so um, uh, him and I talk a lot about um, trauma in the body and really holistic healing practices and different kinds of things for folks um, who are out of initial crisis and working on healing. Um, so I thought I'd bring that conversation that him and I um, like to have a lot to you all so you can hear from him. Go for it. Awesome. Hi, um, I'm Jay Starrett. I'm also coming to you live from my spare room in Olympia, Washington. There may be dogs, there may be cats, there may be toddlers. Um, <laughs> uh, it's true that Michelle and I, um, I think, can go on and on and on about this. I think my biggest challenge in putting this together was trying to keep it um, under 90 minutes. Um, so just to share a little bit more with you about my background, I spent many, many years doing advocacy work. Um, I spent many years doing the advocacy core training for Safe Place in Olympia, Washington. Um, and then in 2013, I became a licensed massage therapist. And then after that, I started doing structural integration and myofascial release work. And that's something I'll, I'll talk a lot more about that if, that if those words don't make sense to you yet. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Before we really jump in, I'm going to share just a little bit more with you. Uh-oh, my arrows aren't working. There we go. Um, I just want to share a little bit more with you about who I am and what my background is. Um, that photo there is me and my son in our happy place. He's about 18 months in that photo, but he's three now. Um, and we just love to hike and play in the forest and having the playground of the Pacific Northwest is um, just a really beautiful gift and we find a lot of joy out there. Um, so I want to tell you not just about like oh, I'm an LMT and this is where I got my training and now I do this structural integration work, but I also want to tell you about a little bit about kind of my process of coming to body work because I really came to this work through both my experience as a survivor of childhood sexual assault and also my experience as an advocate providing services to others. Um, and so when the agency I was working for did an interview of sexual assault survivors to see how we could improve our services, so many survivors spoke about long-term healing and body work being this really life-changing um, thing in their healing process. And that's really what kind of stirred my interest and I started accessing some body work uh, from actually a coworker who left advocacy work to go back to body work. Um, and for me, it was really hard to try to find a body work that was the right fit for me. I was really afraid of receiving touch. It was really hard to find someone who was trauma informed and could hold space for the trauma I had experienced in my life. I'm also transgender and it was really hard to figure out how am I gonna go about finding this provider that's not only going to be trauma informed but that's also going to be trans competent and that's going to be able to create an environment 
where I'm really comfortable letting this stuff come up and working on it. So it was really life changing for me when I found that person. And it was so life changing for me that, you know, less than a year after I started accessing it for myself, I was going through this process of training to learn this work and be able to share it with others. Um, so in the work I do today is called neuromuscular integration. Um, it's a really unique approach to body work that focuses on releasing fascia and connective tissue while also activating the parasympathetic nervous system. In all the work I've experienced, received, and given over the last seven years of doing body work, I find this approach to be really effective for addressing trauma. In particular, I think it's really effective for addressing the freeze response. And that's something we're gonna talk a lot about over the next 90 minutes. So welcome, thank you for being here. I'm really happy to be here with you guys. I'm really happy to be sharing this information and to have this opportunity to kind of bridge uh, my two worlds of advocacy and trauma work and, and body work. And it's actually been really fun for me to be able to kind of bring this information together to share with you guys. All right. So um, here's what I'm hoping that you will have when we're all done with this in 90 minutes. I'm hoping that you guys leave this training with a basic understanding of the neurobiology of trauma. I think for some of you, this may be totally review. I think you guys definitely have some neurobiology of trauma in the advocate core training. So some of it's gonna be review. And even if it is, I think, you know, I find that every time I'm exposed to that information, I glean a little something different and a little something new. So we'll talk a lot about um, fight, flight, and freeze responses and dissociation, the impact of trauma on memory, um, how your nervous system operates in two modes, the parasympathetic and sympathetic. Um, then we'll talk about some practical skills for establishing trauma-informed care practices. And that really applies to us, whether we're advocates, therapists, body workers, whatever kind of work we're doing, the components of trauma-informed care are pretty similar. Um, and then we're going to talk about really what's what's happening physically when trauma is stored in the body. How do we recognize that? How does that freeze response lock into our tissues? And okay, now that we've recognized that's going on with us or it's going on with a client we're working with, what can we do about it? So we'll talk about some really simple, easy, accessible self-care practices like breath work. And then we'll also talk about what to look for in finding the right provider to help you address some of that trauma stored in the body. So I have some questions for you guys about how to tell if a body worker is trauma informed. Um, and then I'll have a bunch of resources and additional reading and places where you can go and get more information about this. So we're going to start with uh, defining trauma. So trauma occurs when both your internal and external resources are inadequate to cope with some kind of external threat. And resources can look like so many different things. Um, that can be, what's your friend, your family, your community group like? What, um, you know, are you living in poverty? Are you able to really easily afford things like therapy and body work? Um, so resources can mean a lot of different things. Really everything about us is pretty profoundly impacted by trauma. The way we think, the way we learn, the way we remember things. And what I think about a lot in my work is about the way we hold and move our bodies and the way trauma really stores in our tissue and affects us in this everyday way in terms of our, our postures, our holding patterns, um, where pain and tension is in our body. So all of these things are really profoundly altered by traumatic experience and trauma is something that really fragments the brain. And we'll talk a lot more about that. Um, epigenetic trauma is something I wanna to touch on really briefly. It's not something that I'm going to spend very much time on, but I think it's useful to kind of just have this in the back of our minds as we're talking about the neurobiology of trauma and the impact of trauma on our brains and bodies. Um, so I want to share with you guys, actually, let me define a little bit more what epigenetic trauma is. So the idea of epigenetic trauma is that we have literally encoded in our DNA, the trauma responses of our ancestors. So, um, whatever traumas your parents and grandparents have experienced and whatever fear they feel and reactivity they have in their system, is genetically encoded and passed 
down onto you. And so the specific scientific study I want to cite about this came out in 2013. And um, what the author says is that the genetic imprint of traumatic experience carries through at least two generations. And so what they did in this study, and it's not a particularly nice to the mice study, um, is they had this group of parent mice and they would shock them. And then they had an accompanying scent that went with the shock. And after enough exposure, right, they repeat that over and over and over again. And then they remove the shock and the mice react to the scent as if they're being shocked. And what they found was that the children of those mice who had never in their lives been shocked reacted to that same scent as if they were being shocked. Their children's children had the same reaction. And it only is out of the DNA in the third generation. And so this is, you know, this is obviously not a study in human beings. And so how much can we extrapolate on this? Um, and I think that, you know, the implications of this are pretty, they're pretty large. And so I, I really want to talk more about this, but I'm also going to let it go and keep moving us through the rest of the content. But something to just kind of keep in mind as we talk about the impact of trauma on the brain and body that as people heal, you know, they're not just having to address the way that their own trauma that they've experienced in their lives lives in their tissues and their brains, but also the trauma of their ancestors. And so one of the things about this that, um, that I think is really beautiful is I see the implication of this information as, you know, when we heal trauma in ourselves, we're actually healing trauma in our ancestral line. And we're also healing trauma down the future of our line. Um, and I think that's really beautiful. Okay, so getting a little more into the science of some of this. Your nervous system essentially has two modes. There's not a whole lot of in between. So your nervous system is either in sympathetic or parasympathetic mode. Your sympathetic mode is like you are in instinct, you're ready to respond, you're ready to react, you're ready to jump into action. If you're hypervigilant, you're in that sympathetic nervous system. If you're in your fight, flight, freeze response, you're in that sympathetic nervous system. And this is super, super useful for when we're in danger. Like if you're running from a bear, right? You really want everything else in your brain to go offline and that survival mode to kick in so that you can run from that bear and not die. The problem comes when you spend all of your time running from a bear. And in nature, um, this is something uh, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about Trump, uh, Peter Levine, who's a trauma researcher and really brilliant uh, expert in this area, and he'll talk about when animals experience a near-death um, trauma, like being chased by a predator, that afterwards they will literally, um, and you can look for this next time you watch a nature documentary, the animal will literally jump in the air and do this, what looks like kind of a full body spasm, and it literally is this shaking out of the trauma, and it's something that we don't do and that we've forgotten how to do and I think that has a lot to do with culture um, and shame and the way we're socialized um, in terms of what like wh how it's okay to express ourselves in our bodies. Does that make sense? Okay um, so for a lot of trauma survivors uh, we can get stuck in that sympathetic nervous system in a place where we're never really able to downshift into that parasympathetic. And that parasympathetic place is where so much healing in the body happens, right? So this is, um, we're in that parasympathetic state when we're totally calm and relaxed in our body, we're calm and relaxed in our mind. Often people are dropping into that parasympathetic nervous system when they're sleeping. But again, for trauma survivors, sometimes even sleep is a place where they're not able to drop in to that parasympathetic. The other thing that happens um, in that parasympathetic nervous system is 
all your metabolic processes like digestion, they only take place when your nervous system is in that parasympathetic mode. So you can imagine for survivors of trauma, right? If you're forever in that sympathetic space, your body never has a chance to do its basic healing processes or even basic functions like digestion. And that's one of the reasons it's really, really common for trauma survivors to have um, GI issues, right? gastrointestinal issues. So um, body work can be a really, really effective way to help the nervous system shift gears and drop down into that parasympathetic rest and digest and calm place. Um, and you know, as I'm working with folks, I can see that happening in their bodies. And there's all kinds of little clues from, um, you know, an, an ability to kind of let their body just get heavy on the table. Um, and then I think the other thing that, that is often kind of a clue that someone's dropped into the parasympathetic nervous system is I start hearing movement in the stomach. I start hearing that peristalsis through the, through the intestines and, and that's just like the, the tummy gurgling sound, right? And that's a really good indication that someone's been able to just drop into that parasympathetic, which is a really great thing. And that, that place is where the best body work happens as well, the most effective body work. Okay, so we're gonna talk about fight and flight and we're gonna talk about freeze in a minute. We're gonna focus a lot more on the freeze response because I really believe that's where trauma gets stuck in the tissues. Um, but we're gonna talk about fight and flight too. So all of those responses, fight, flight, freeze, they are an automatic physiological response. It's a biological mechanism that is in place to protect us from harm. And it's our body doing exactly what it's supposed to do. Um, it happens every time we perceive that we're in danger. And then each episode of danger, each traumatic experience connects to every other traumatic experience. So over time, the more danger we're exposed to, the more sensitive we become to those dangers. So let's dial in a little more to that freeze response. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have heard of or seen fainting goats before. Um, they're called myotonic goats and fainting goats, uh, when they're startled, they have such an intense freeze response that their whole entire little goat body locks up and they fall over. And uh, a Google search will yield you many, many, many videos of fainting goats falling over. Um, and it's kind of a useful image because it's the same mechanism in their brains. It's that same self-protection mechanism that is operating for us when we drop into that freeze response. And we don't have any more control over it than those myotonic goats do. And I think it's a place where a lot of, yes, tonic immobility is absolutely the word for that. Thanks, Michelle. Um, what was I gonna say? Um, that freeze response is a little bit unique in terms of how that response uh, creates trauma stored in the tissues. Um, and in that way, it's kind of different than the fight or flight response. So I'm gonna use kind of a more ex innocuous example of a car accident, right? So um, you may be familiar with, there, there's a lot of research out there that shows that in drunk driving accidents, the person that's intoxicated almost always is able to escape that accident without injury and or with very mild injuries. The people in that accident who are sober often have very severe injuries. And the reason for that is the freeze response. The person who's intoxicated, their freeze response is being shut down by the alcohol. And so the fact that they're not locking their body up right before the accident is what enables them to not be so severely injured, right? And so part of what happens in that freeze is that that trauma, that moment of trauma gets really locked into our system. Um, I also think that freeze response is nearly universal for survivors of sexual assault. And it's also a place where we often feel a lot of guilt. Like, oh, I froze. I could have done this. I could have, I should have said something. I should have, could have, would have. Right? And so I think this is really helpful information to share with trauma survivors because you can apply this to yourself in your own situation and go, oh, I'm not actually weak. 
I'm not actually crazy. I'm a human with this body and this brain and I'm having this very normal um, response to a horrible abnormal situation, right? Um, typically, uh, the, the freeze response tends to lock into some kind of predictable areas in the body. Often the abdomen, I realize I'm touching my abdomen, but you can't see me. Um, so often the, the abdomen, the spine, the, really the front of the torso, the breath, all of that locks up in the freeze response, right? Part of what happens when we freeze is we hold our breath, right? And so it's not just that we kind of freeze in place, but in addition to the freezing, it's that this whole front of the body gets locked up. And part of what we do when we feel fear, um, particularly if that fear is really, you know, trauma level, afraid for your life, that fear, you know, a lot of trauma experts will talk about the fear of annihilation of yourself or someone else being something that really creates intense trauma. Um, and so part of what happens in that freeze is we're also locking up the entire front of the body. We're taking the rib cage and we're slamming it down onto the pelvis to protect the internal organs, to protect this tender abdominal space. And when we do that, there's a really big core muscle called your psoas, and it goes from your entire lower spine, all of your lumbar vertebrae, passes through your pelvis and plugs into your leg. We take that muscle and we slam it down. And what I find in working with survivors of trauma is that that psoas holds so much trauma for people. Um, and that's certainly my experience as well in receiving work. Um, and the way we, the way I, the way we work that muscle is, is essentially by, by touching that muscle and we're, we're basically pressing up against the spine through the abdomen. And as you can imagine, that can be a pretty intense and vulnerable experience for people. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more, I'll talk more about body work a little bit later. Um, so I think one of the other things, this is gonna be a theme that we come back to over and over again, um, right? We have this freeze response. It's essentially dissociation and we're gonna define that a little bit more in a minute, right? And that, that freeze response and that dissociation is what makes, what helps you survive the trauma, right? It's the thing that, that kept your brain safe because what was happening was too much for your brain to be able to process at the time. So you have this, we have this beautiful biological mechanism that protects us from harm. And then over the long term, we're dissociating in all kinds of situations where we're not actually facing harm, right? And so we have this short-term response that's really life-saving, that's a really important life-saving coping mechanism that eventually kind of becomes maladaptive. And so this theme that the response that kept you from harm becomes the response that keeps you from healing is something that's gonna come up um, a few more times as we talk. Okay, so one of the other things that happens with trauma is this kind of uh, again, kind of thinking about uh, our systems of arousal as sort of an on-off switch. So thinking of, you know, in a normal situation, in the absence of trauma, that you are able to respond to whatever that tr situation is, you're able to respond to the stimulus based on the threat that stimulus presents, right? And I kind of think of that as a, a volume dial, right? You could go whatever feeling you're having, it could be anywhere from zero to 10, right? And part of what trauma does is it destabilizes that internal system of, of arousal that I think of as sort of volume control that we normally have over our emotions, particularly fear. And so instead, it's more of an on-off switch. It's zero to 10 instead of zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Um, for a lot of folks who've experienced trauma, uh, we might resort to substance use. And I'm not just talking about drugs and alcohol, but also addictive behaviors like compulsive sex, eating, self-harm, uh, things like that to calm and control internal states, right? And cigarettes. that's, what'd you say? Cigarettes. <laughs> cigarettes, yes. Cigarettes are huge for people, yeah. They are, yes, they are. <laughs> um, so kind of again, coming back to this theme of the thing that helped us 
heal becomes this thing that, or I'm sorry, the, the thing that helped us get through the original crisis becomes this thing that prevents us from healing. And that's, that's kind of the challenge in healing trauma, right? And what Bessel van der Kolk says about that, who uh, wrote The Body Keeps Score, which is a really amazing, lovely, incredible, great book about how trauma is stored in the body. Um, and I have a big list of resources for you guys at the end. So uh, anything I cite in here is gonna be on a page for you at the very end. Um, anyway, what Bessel van der Kolk says is the great challenge is finding ways to reset their physiology so that their survival mechanisms stop working against them. And again, I just think about the value of defining this uh, for trauma survivors in general, for clients that we're working with, because I think what happens so much when you're in this situation where your own survival mechanisms are working against you is you feel crazy. And so sharing this information with people, I think is, can be deeply validating for people. And I know in my own healing experience, um, learning this information has been deeply validating for me as well. So memory is also really profoundly altered um, when we're experiencing trauma. And this relates really strongly to why and how some of that trauma stores in our body and in our tissues, right? So one of the things that happens when we're overwhelmed with fear is that we, part of that freeze is, you know, we don't just kind of lose our breath, but we lose our words. And we often kind of lose that capacity for speech and lose that capacity to put words to our experience. Because so much, especially as adults, of how we function in, in terms of, of memory is rooted in language and being able to describe, even if we're just thinking about it, being able to apply words to any given memory. So when that goes offline, the mind shifts to this much more visceral form of memory, this kind of visual, auditory, olfactory, kinesthetic images, uh, physical sensations, feelings, um, and memory is stored in a very different way and literally in a different place in the brain. Um, and when someone is experiencing a flashback, you know, I think we have a lot of images, um, you know, on television and in our culture of a flashback being kind of a memory. And I really think of it not as like a remembering, but as a re-experiencing of those unverbalized memories, uh, more of a reliving than a remembering. Um, so to me, what this really means is, yes, therapy, like talk therapy, advocacy, opportunities for survivors to talk about their experience is really, really important. And I think in this movement, that's something that has had a strong focus for a long time. And I think what's been missing from this movement is providing opportunities that really focus on nonverbal expression and trauma release. Um, and I think there are a lot, a lot of places where um, the movement against violence and sexual violence is really moving in that direction, which is really exciting. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about dissociation. So I think of dissociation as this Again, this biological mechanism, this safety valve that's in place to protect us whenever there is something in our world that's too overwhelming for our brain to process. Um, and here's my very dictionary definition of dissociation. It is a disruption in the usually integrated functions of consciousness, memory, identity, or perception of the environment. So like, what does that mean? Um, it really splits off our experience from our feelings about that experience. And, you know, we all dissociate in one way or another, even if we don't have trauma, right? You might be driving down I-5 from, say, Olympia to Seattle, and suddenly you've passed Tacoma, but you don't remember the last 30 miles at all, you know, because you've been off somewhere dissociating. Right, so we all do that in these little small ways. Um, I found myself when this pandemic first started like driving and driving as if I was going to work and just sort of having these mindless moments in my car and then going, oh wait, no, things are very different now. You're not going to work. <laughs> um, so we all dissociate in some way or another. And what happens with trauma is you have this repetitive trauma and dissociation over a period of time. And then you have, 
combined with that dissociation, you have flashbacks, right? And so the, the combination of those two symptoms, um, your avoidance symptoms, which are dissociation, right? We dissociate to avoid something painful or unpleasant, combined with intrusive symptoms, right? Flashbacks are not something we're usually inviting. They're usually an unpleasant surprise. Um, the combination of those two symptoms constitute the clinical diagnosis for PTSD, right? And so that's what most of the trauma survivors we're working with are dealing with. Um, again, really recognizing that these are coping mechanisms that are really, really effective and necessary and often life-saving in the short term, but that they become detrimental um, in the long term. And again, coming back to that theme that the response that kept you from harm becomes the response that keeps you from healing. Please, do you mind if I add something about dissociation? Yeah, please do. Because it's such a, co it's a coping mechanism, you know, that is, like you said, so useful. And once, after survivors have kind of gone through healing, right, and we know healing is a spiral, so you're gonna have to come around back to things that you find traumatizing or hard, um, you know, to kind of deal with them again and find a different way of approaching them, right, from a different angle, different perspective. Um, but one of my good friends does a lot of birth work, um, who is also a sexual assault advocate and a doula. And working with a survivor um, who had, you know, long been uh, going through healing, uh, working on her dissociation, you know, really finding new and, and, and just really useful coping mechanisms and really out of the woods, you know, from her childhood sexual abuse. But when she became pregnant, you know, she, in her birth plan, when she was talking to her advocate doula, she was like, you know, I think my birth plan is that I'm going to dissociate. That like almost as a conscious thing, she's like, and if I do that, I just want you guys to let me disappear. If that's what I need to do, I think that's what I'm just going to, you know, if you guys can just let me let that happen. And then I, I feel like that's the only way that I'm going to be able to kind of move through this. You know, she's like, I know I'm going to miss it. And I think that's okay, but I think this is my birth plan. And I just thought that was so interesting mm -hmm. you know, with dissociation, because you always think of it as like a something that is, um, you know, something so hard to control. But once you get a handle on a lot of things, sometimes you really are adept at turning it off and on, uh, or you just know the kind of things that are you're going to dissociate, are going to trigger you, and then you plan around them, right? It's so interesting the power of survivors to be able to know really intensely about their bodies when they start to do to to approach that work right thank you so much for sharing that you said a number of things that i kind of want to touch on uh, again one is really having people be in charge of their own healing and how how creative people can be um in their own healing process and the other is that um yeah, I'm definitely trying to uh, describe dissociation not as something that's necessarily negative. And so um, I think it's definitely something that we can use to help us get through um, difficult situations. That was a really, that was a really good example. And it's just making my brain spin thinking about uh, my partner's birth <laughs> and our birth plan and all the trauma stuff we talked about leading up to that. Um, Cool, thanks Michelle. So I wanna to touch briefly on um, trauma and oppression. Um, I think these two are obviously uh, very fundamentally linked. Um, I think that part of what makes sexual assault in particular so traumatizing is the way that it is not just, you know, an assault and attack, but it's an assault on our, so often on our sense of self and on our identities, um, whether that's really explicit or more implied it's it's there often it's there almost again almost universally i think that's there for survivors of sexual assault so you have that experience and then later on top of that many many of the people you're working with are also people who are marginalized and constantly experiencing microaggressions related to their identity in addition to the trauma of physical and sexual violence that they've experienced. So as providers, it's really important for us to develop an understanding of how someone's identity might impact their experience of trauma, right? How might someone's race or 
ability, class, gender identity, sexual orientation, religious affiliations, how might all those different pieces of ourselves and our identities impact not just our experience with trauma, but our experience in trying to heal trauma. And that's something I think about a lot in my practice is, um, you know, I, I'm, I, I see cultural competence as not a finite process. It's a lifelong commitment to learning and you never really achieve it. You don't get up one day and say, hey, I'm culturally competent now. I know all the things about all the people, right? And so I think it's really important to be humble and I also think it's really valuable to identify your areas of expertise, right? So both in my um, history in providing an advocacy, in my work as a body worker, and in my personal experience, I have a lot of expertise in providing services to people who identify as trans. And so that's something I really uh, call out in my practice and really encourage people who are looking, um, what am I trying to say? I really prioritize creating a space that is really trans competent. And I know from my own experience how hard it can be to find a provider who is respectful, willing to hold space, and really able to meet your needs, right? And so I can extrapolate based on that personal experience some of the challenges, even if I don't un understand it from in a firsthand way, I can still kind of use that to understand how someone with an identity that's really different than mine might be facing barriers in their access to services or how their experience in their identity impacts um, how they feel about their trauma, how they talk about it, how they identify their trauma, how it stores in their body, all of those things. Um, again, something I really want to talk more about and I'm going to keep moving us on just for the sake of time. Um, but I think this is something to think about, uh, you know, just as a kind of foundational principle when you're talking about trauma and when you're talking about creating trauma-informed services, it's really important that this framework be a part of that. Um, and I think to be oppressed is to be traumatized. I know that I hold those microaggressions in my body. I know that I hold times that I've been yelled at or spit on or harassed. I know that I hold that inside of me, even if today my experience walking through the world is pretty safe. Um, those experiences are still really held in my body and in my tissues. So um, we're kind of getting towards the end of wrapping this section up. So I'm going to have a moment for questions in just a second. So what is all of this stuff about trauma theory and the neurobiology of trauma? Like, what does that really mean for us in terms of our approaches working with people? And I think one of them is sort of this fundamental framework shift. I think it's easy to look at someone who's experienced trauma and who may be having uh, some of the symptoms we've just talked about. I think it's easy to just judge that person and kind of have a what's wrong with you attitude. And so if we can roll that attitude back, and I know it's not likely that many of us in this room have it, and still I think it's a really socialized attitude. Um, so instead of approaching people with what's wrong with you, having this more openness, um, this curiosity of what's happened to you, how did you get here to where you are today? Um, I think bringing our awareness to our ingrained and socialized assumptions and biases, I think we all have them. I think there's no way that we are, that we, we get through life without being trained and fed misinformation about things like race and sex and gender. And so I think it's really important for us as providers to, in, to unpack whatever our history is with those topics so that we can kind of set aside as much as possible what our really ingrained biases are. And I think when the people we're working with receive that, that curiosity, that desire to understand, it really enables people to begin to understand themselves a little bit more and start to make some of those positive changes. So in order to make that possible, we have to create physical and psychological safety. And really what I'm saying is we have to create trauma-informed services. So um, the next thing we're gonna talk about is how do we do that as advocates and how do we do that in body work? But before we shift gears and start talking about that, I just wanna hold a little space 
um, for any questions about the neurobiology of trauma, any questions about anything we've talked about so far. And I'm actually gonna take like a two second break and go use the potty. So I will be right back. Um, so take a moment and think about if you guys have any questions. Um, I'll be right back, we'll answer your questions. And then next we're gonna shift gears and talk more about creating trauma-informed care practices um, and practicing consent in our work. I'll be right back. <clears throat> One of the questions that came up while um, um, Jace was um, discussing fight or flight uh, was from Libby and it, and it says, what do you think about a response uh, in quotes, fawn, F-A-W-N, uh, fawn, to add another to fight, flight, freeze? Um, a client brought this up to me that not only does someone freeze, but they purposely go along with assault <clears throat> because it's often safer than resisting. Yes, I often hear this referred to as uh, appease. So fight, flight, freeze, appease. So you can have more rhyming things or you can use alliteration and say fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. Um, and yes, if anybody has <clears throat> seen um, Unbelievable, which is um, a limited series on Netflix about um, kind of two different victims of uh, sexual abuse and their experiences, um, excuse me, with rape and then uh, moving through systems. Uh, and in Unbelievable, one of the, <clears throat> um, one of the victims spent a lot of time asking questions of the person who was raping her uh, and like being curious about him and asking him questions. And that really falls under that appease of fight, flight, freeze, and appease. And, um, and not only did it help her kind of stay alive and stay safe, right? If you're kind of going along with things. Also, it really made it possible for her to encode more memory uh, and details that she was later able to use um, in, you know, in her law enforcement interview and be able to give information because she oh. So, <clears throat> yes, appease is, uh, you know, super, super relevant. I feel like a lot of people um, absolutely. Sorry, that was my three-year-old. <laughs> That's okay. Anything, Jace, that you want to say about appease or fawn? Um, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. I, I, I feel like I should have thrown that in there with the fight and flight. Um, I think maybe you guys were talking about this before I was back in the room, but um, yeah, I think the appease is another survival strategy that survivors use and that and that often I think in similar ways to the freeze, I think there's there can be a lot of guilt about um, having an appease response or an appease survival strategy. And I also think that is particularly with, with people who are in long-term abusive and violent situations um, that the appease is, is an almost universal response mm -hmm. to long-term um, abuse and assault. So thank you for whoever asked that question. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? You can use the Q&A box or you can use the chat box. I've got them both open and can take a look. Oops, wait, I think there's one. Does appease ever become permanent? Beverly is asking. Appease ever become permanent? I don't, uh, I don't know that anything is permanent, but go ahead. Yeah, well, actually, that's that's exactly what I was going to say. I don't think anything has to become permanent, but I think that, and, and a lot of what we're going to talk about, um, and what you kind of touched on with your story of your friend, um, who's the doula, is the value of, of awareness, right? And so in our healing work, we're not necessarily stopping the symptoms of trauma in that work. Maybe we're lessening them over time, but so much of what we're doing really is, is actually cultivating an awareness of those internal responses so that when they happen, you have a toolkit and you have new and different ways of responding instead of just responding from this automatic kind of trauma brain place. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's really what I see as the goal of a lot of healing work is not just um, um, not just in, in let me rephrase that in both 
like talk therapy approaches and body work approaches to healing work, I think a lot of the goal is cultivating that awareness. Yeah. Um, if you can be stuck in a state of sympathetic, you can be stuck in I would also add, you know, that with, when we're talking about appease, I think that there's, um, there's a level of oppression, kind of systemic oppression and learned behaviors uh, for those of us that were uh, socialized as women or socialized as girls when we were young to, to appease. Uh, in a lot of ways, or for the, just those of us in cultures where children are taught to appease, um, that that can be something that is ingrained um, and useful or just used as not just a coping mechanism, like to stay safe and stay alive, but as a kind of a learned behavior, like I'm in a lower part of the social hierarchy, so I need to go along with what this elder person is saying I need to do or what my parent says to do or whatever trusted friend or family, right. That can be used, um, in grooming techniques. Right. So I feel like it's, um, it's, it's like a double edged sword for those of us that are socialized as women or those of us that are socialized in cultures where that hierarchy is very much ingrained to appease. So I want to share actually a story about that, that I was going to share a little bit later on, but I will share it now instead. Um, I was working with a client about a year ago, someone I've known and worked with for a very, very long time. We've probably been doing body work together for about five years. Um, and uh, part of the work I do is a structural integration, neuromuscular integration series. And it's a series of 11 sessions where we really methodically go through um, all of the fascia in the body head to toe and release it in this very kind of particular way. Um, so I had this person who was going through the, that series and part of the series work includes some work, uh, some external pelvic floor work. And, and so we had a conversation ahead of time about, um, you know, all the different work we were going to do. And then at each session, we would have another specific conversation about the work we were going to do that day. So before we started, she was like, you know, I'm not really sure if I'm going to be open to that or not. Um, can you check in with me when it gets closer? So when we got to the session where there's, and it's not a, it's not the focus of the session. It's, it's 10 or 15 minutes of work in that area. And when we got to that session, we talked about it again. And even at the beginning of the session, she was still like, Oh, I don't know. Can we, can you ask me again, like mid session when we get to that part and then I'll decide, then I'll know. And I was like, no problem. So we get to that part and there was sort of this initial verbal yes, but there was so much hesitation. There was so much, like there was, it was so, all of the body language, the tone, everything said no, but what was coming out of her mouth was a yes. So I just said, you know, I really want to check in one more time because honestly, what I'm feeling from you is a no and that's okay. Um, I really want this to be a space where it's okay for you to say no to something that you're uncomfortable with or to something that you don't, your body doesn't want to receive. And so she ended up saying no. And after the session, um, she became really emotional about it. And she was crying. And part of what she shared is, uh, you know, the depth of that appease response and that, you know, that some of the things that went through her mind in saying no was that she was afraid to disappoint me, which, you know, it's, it's not my body getting work done. Um, she was afraid that somehow it would ruin all the other work that she was receiving <laughs> and that she wouldn't be able to access the trauma release she was looking for if she didn't do pelvic floor work. You know, all of these things that were not true. And then what she shared was how powerful it was to be very intentionally invited to say no to something that she didn't want in her body. And she, like, again, she had become really emotional and was crying about it and said that um, it was the first time ever in her life in, you know, from medical situations to trauma situations where she had felt comfortable saying no to something that was going to happen uh, to her body and how 
powerful it was for her to have an opportunity to practice that skill in a very contained uh, safe space and how much that fed a really profound shift for her in being able to be more boundaried and more clear in herself and more clear in her communication with others about what her boundaries are. Any other questions? Yeah, Libby says, are there any studies that show good results about healed traumas not being passed down or are both healed and unhealed trauma something that becomes encoded in us? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I don't have I don't have a really solid research-based answer off the top of my head. My belief is that when we have healed those traumas in ourselves, that we do not pass them down. So when we heal that trauma reaction in ourselves, I believe that we prevent it from being passed down. Um, it would be interesting to see what uh, what research has maybe come out since that study was published in 2013 and see if there's anything about that. So I don't have a really solid answer beyond sort of my, this is what I feel. Right, yeah, I don't, I don't know if there is even any, anything on that, but. Yeah, that's a really good question though. Thank you for asking. Okay, anything else? All right, let's go ahead and move on. Okay, so we're gonna shift gears a little bit and talk about um, you know, what values and practices we can have in place to create trauma-informed um, services. So, um, this comes from Wixap, actually, or comes from Sadie demonstration, comes, comes from y'all. Um, so these are core principles of trauma-informed care. Uh, safety, trust, choice, collaboration, empowerment, and cultural relevancy. And some of these things we've talked about just a little bit. Um, you know, at the, at the foundation of all of these, how we do a lot of these is through consent, through a consent-based framework. Um, so let's talk a little bit more. I, I think there are some differences in how I might address these issues in body work compared with how most of you, because I think most of the folks in the room are doing advocacy work, compared with how you, you guys might address these things with your advocacy work. So um, I'm gonna kind of talk about it from a body work perspective. Um, so some things I do uh, to create safety, ensuring physical and emotional safety, is making sure that that client knows that they are in charge of their treatment. They're in charge of areas of touch, they're in charge of depth, and really that they're the expert on their body, having lived in it for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Um, and so that's just one you know, really small way that I can create some safety is really reminding people that they're in charge, that they're the expert on their body, that they can stop the session at any time, that they can um, you know, request for me to adjust things in the session at any time, like, depth, pressure, areas of touch, um, all, of, all of that is within their control. And having a variety of ways that I communicate that and remind them of that throughout the session. Um, creating trust, I think consent is a very important part of creating trust. Um, and that part of that is having really clear boundaries as a provider, um, very clear boundaries, clear communication and consent. So. For me, that means having a conversation with people about things like draping. So telling folks that they're going to be draped for the entire session, that we're only going to undrape areas we're working on. Um, genitals are always covered, things like that. And then also things like staying in my scope of practice, right? It's, it's, um, I can hold space for trauma. I can talk to people about the ways that trauma stores in their body, but I can't create a therapeutic treatment plan for addressing their trauma because that's beyond my scope of practice right and i think it is for you guys as advocates too you can share resources you can share information but you're not going to sit down with someone and say okay now we're going to start doing emdr because <laughs> that's beyond your scope of practice right so um just a second here 
Um, so I think another piece of establishing that trust for me is having defined roles. Um, and I think this is really true for you guys as advocates. Um, making sure that you are centering the person you're working with and not yourself. So for me, that might mean, you know, if I'm spending an entire session talking about, you know, my problems or my challenges in life or, or just chatting, I'm really taking away then from that client's ability to focus on release trauma. I'm taking away from having that interaction be something that is about them. And if I'm putting a lot of myself in there, then I'm kind of making it about me. Does that make sense? I feel like I'm not being super articulate about that. So when it comes to my work, I really let clients drive how much talking we do. You know, if someone's feeling really chatty and they wanna talk the whole session, that's fine. And if they wanna be really quiet and say nothing the whole session, that's fine too. So again, just kind of letting survivors and clients lead. Um, and choice is a really important part of how we establish safety and trust. I think ensuring choice is how we create safety and trust. Um, so going back to that story I told, being invited to say no, that's a huge way that I create safety and trust and ensure that people have choice, knowing that they can say no to the session at any time. Um, I really like this quote from Stacey Haynes who wrote The Survivor's Guide to Sex. And it says, the ability to choose based on your own internal experience, what you want physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and sexually, and then communicate those wants. Consent is an ongoing process of making choices. Oh, thank you. And Michelle is holding up the book right now. Um, So coming back to this. I want to come into this concept of collaboration with body work. You know, I think a lot of people come in and they have this attitude that I'm an expert or that like I'm going to do something to them. And really this work is very much about collaboration and so is your work as advocates. Um, you know, I'm, I'm holding space, I'm holding space without judgment, I'm meeting people where they're at, but I'm not really doing something to them. We're really working together to create change in their body. So, you know, I'm meeting them with my touch, they're meeting me with their breath, with their awareness, with their intention, with their focus. Um, and it's really, it really is a collaboration. It's us working together to create change. And often I get to the end of a session with someone and I'm like, wow, you worked really hard today. You know, and people will say things about, wow, you worked really hard. And, you know, often I feel the client is working just as hard as I am. Um, I will just add to yeah. Jace, just based on my experience with both doing massage and getting massaged um, and also receiving massages from you, like relaxing totally is really hard work um, for um, a lot of people, even people who have not been um, experienced a lot of trauma. Just relaxing your body to the extent that you can really, you know, relax into that parasympathetic place where somebody can move your arm and then it will just fall, right? I've gotten really good at that over time. But um, also, you know, that is a lot of work. It's a lot of work to just trust and kind of allow that. And so that's your big part. That's how you participate in that body work piece by letting go, right? And that's a lot, that's a lot of trust work. That's a lot of hard work. It's not physical, like, you know, the kneading and all that stuff that we do as massage therapists, but it's a different kind of really hard work. Thank you for saying that. Um, yeah, I think it is really hard work to be able to actively drop, especially if you're coming in kind of jacked up into that sympathetic, to do the work to actively drop your body down into that parasympathetic requires a lot of um, focus and energy and intention. Uh, I have a mentor in the bodywork world who says that um, relaxation is not a finite process. You can always drop in, 
a little bit deeper. So I think about that a lot in doing breathing exercises, in trying to kind of soften and let my own body be heavy, is that I'll kind of have this moment where I'm like, oh, I think I'm there. And then I realize I can actually take that a little bit deeper. Um, and breath is one of the ways that we can do that. And, and we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Um, okay, let's see here. Collaboration, empowerment. Um, I think this is, this is really a huge piece of doing body work with people is being really strength-based. Strength um, acknowledging skill building, I think, is really important. And I think the example Michelle just gave was perfect. I have a lot of folks who, when they first come in to see me, they have no idea how to relax, how to allow their body to soften, how to breathe into that internal space and get heavy on the table. And often when people first come in, that's a skill set that we're really working together to develop. And so being really encouraging of that. And I, and I think often people go, gosh, why is this so hard for me? Why am I having such a hard time? And so being able to draw on that trauma theory information and saying, well, this is why it's really hard for you. And this is why it's valuable. And you're doing amazing. Look at where you are today with your skill in being able to drop in and receive this work versus where you were at at our first appointment a year ago or five years ago. Um, and then of course, of course, cultural relevancy. So coming back to the ideas of trauma and oppression and making sure that we are as providers kind of constantly learning about and being open to um, experiences outside of our own identities so that we can hold space for those experiences. And I, and I think along with that, like our, our cultural experiences really inform our experiences with trauma. Um, you know, how we define trauma, how we feel about it, how we talk about it, all of those things are pretty profoundly impacted by culture. You know, and I would actually add, at least for myself, um, I would add one more thing to really create, I think, trauma-informed care services. The piece I would add as providers is accountability. We're all human. We all make mistakes sometimes. Uh, I can think of a mistake I made just this week uh, in my work. And I think it's really valuable to be able to say, oops, you know, to be able to say, I made a mistake. I didn't mean to do that. And particularly when making a mistake um, sometimes can make someone feel harmed in some way, right? And so making sure that we're really accountable and that we own mistakes that we make as well. Okay, so that's kind of, that's, we're wrapping up a little bit, trauma-informed care, and we're gonna shift gears and talk about recognizing trauma in the body and how to release it, how body work can help with those processes, and some ways to vet uh, potential providers. Do you guys have any questions about um, establishing trauma-informed care frameworks in your practices or your work as advocates? Okay. Um, Somebody asked, Sam asks, how do you work with survivors who may be experiencing SUD or CD? I think that means substance use disorder or chemical dependency maybe. Um, Sam, let me know if I'm wrong about that. Uh, how do you work with survivors who may be experiencing that and have either used before sessions or are withdrawing during? That's a really good question. Um, you know, if someone is severely intoxicated um, then I would reschedule the session. Um, often, if you have an intoxicating substance in your system, receiving body work will actually push it through your system faster. So it can really, um, uh, you know, if you're, if you come in intoxicated and drunk and you get a, um, intoxicated with alcohol and you get a massage, it can literally, it'll, it'll push all of that alcohol through your liver faster. And so um, it can increase risks of things like alcohol poisoning. Um, 
That said, you know, I think that there are some substances that can be useful to people in receiving massage work as well. Um, I do have a lot of clients who use marijuana. I have clients who use marijuana before their sessions. Um, and I have lots of folks who use that and feel like it um, helps them to kind of drop down into that parasympathetic nervous system and receive the work. So, um, you know, there's, there's that sort of substance use um, before sessions, which I think can be intentional, is intentional and can be helpful. Um, and then there's, I think, more, more severe hard substances that I would reschedule the session if that's what was going on. Um, I think that body work can be really helpful for people who are going through withdrawal um, from substances. Um, yeah, any other questions about that? It's just, but it's just like everything else. It's like staying within your scope of work and mm -hmm. if it's beyond you, then a referral is needed or an additional resource. And I think it's great to make sure that you're really familiar with the resources in your area so that if that does happen, you can say, you know what, we're not going to be able to do our session today. Um, but if you're looking for services, here are some, here are some resources for you. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else before we move on to the next piece? Okay, so for a couple of these slides, I have some handouts for you guys that you can kind of use as guides for yourselves or share with clients. Um, so uh, gonna I'm gonna give you, a, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, Michelle's gonna send those out. So I'm gonna give you a lot of information about recognizing trauma stored in the body and just know that you're gonna get a handout with all that info on it, with everything I'm gonna talk about um, that has a lot more detail than this slide does. So um, before I go into this, the different symptoms and stuff I'm going to talk about, um, you can experience those for, you know, a myriad of reasons. Uh, none of this discussion about these different symptoms is uh, intended to treat or diagnose any condition, but rather to help people identify their own internal sensations uh, that may be connected to trauma and to help you, you know, identify some of this as you're working with your clients as well. So. Uh, disconnection and dissociation. So this can look like feelings of disconnection from some areas of your body um, or not being able to access internal, internal sensations, right? So, you know, in my own experience, I, one of the places I've done a lot of work in body work is being able to get in touch with my pelvis because that's an area that I really strongly disassociated for a long time. Um, and you know, I've had a lot of clients talk about being, you know, just as an example, being really unaware of their arms, just kind of not feeling like their arms are connected to their body. Um, I think one of the best descriptions I've heard a client say about this is feeling like they're just a floating head and just feeling like this awareness and presence here and a total, just feeling totally disconnected and unable to get present or aware, basically from the neck down. Um, physical pain and tension, kind of a pulling sensation in your tissues, um, that's not the result of any other medical condition. Um, this can happen anywhere in the body, and we touched on this a little bit earlier for trauma survivors, it's typically really commonly held in the core of the body, held in that front space, moving from the front of the pelvis up into the sternum and clavicles. That's most often where trauma lives, and that's because of our instinct to slam that front of the body down, to drop the rib cage onto the pelvis, and protect all of our internal organs. Um, GI issues are really common for trauma survivors, so being stuck in that sympathetic nervous system means that those metabolic processes go offline. Well, digestion is a really big one of those metabolic processes. And so that goes offline and your nervous system is maintaining all this other hypervigilance that it thinks that you need to stay safe. Um, yeah, gastrointestinal, just for... Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, breath. So again, that freeze response, we really hold that freeze response in our breath. Um, part of that response is often that we 
and we just stop breathing and we lock all of our muscle tissues down. And so that's something that can really hold in people's bodies for a long time. Um, and that's something that was certainly true for, my, for me in my experience and receiving work that released the constriction in my rib cage is something that has been completely life-changing for me. Um, so constriction in your breath, difficulty fully expanding the rib cage, you know, being able to get to that parasympathetic place, we have to be able to breathe deeply into our bodies. And if our rib cage is constricted and our lungs can't expand and fill with air and we can't get a full body, full breath, that has an impact on so many different things. Um, your that that process of respiration of bringing oxygen into your lungs is how oxygen gets into literally all of your cells so if your respiration is limited then eventually your cellular function becomes limited as well and that can impact your immune system it can impact your ability to fight off um, various viruses uh, etc. Um, and finally, uh, difficulty relaxing your body enough to get a good and full night's sleep. So I'm thinking again about what Michelle was saying about what a skill it is, how hard it is to be able to like relax your body. And I actually think that practicing that in body work is something that can really help people be able to drop into that skill when they're trying to go to sleep. So I'm going to talk more about how the body releases trauma and how body work can help with that. But um, I also know that, you know, in the moment of really feeling this trauma in your body, that might not be something you're able to access. So let's talk about a couple different things that you can do for self-care if you're recognizing that you have trauma in your body or things you can suggest to folks you're working with if you or they are recognizing trauma in their body. Um, so I think breath is an incredibly useful tool for addressing body stored trauma. And uh, I'm gonna take you guys through a brief breathing exercise in a few minutes, but let's go through these other pieces on this slide first. Um, okay. So I will, I guess I will touch just briefly on breath because I think any sort of, any sort of deep breathing I think can be helpful for body stored trauma. Um, so anything you might have experience with in your own life, um, you know, everything from if you've ever sang in a choir to, um, movement and spiritual practices that combine intentional movement with intentional breath, things like yoga and Tai Chi. Those are all really good skills to bring to the table when it comes to addressing trauma stored in the body. Um, and so we'll talk more about breath in a minute. So I'm going to jump forward to movement. <sighs> Embodied movement can be really hard for trauma survivors to access, especially when they're in the initial phases of working on their healing processes. Um, so I think any, any physical movement you enjoy can be really helpful for body stored trauma. So, um, and again, I think particularly movement practices that combine intentional movement with breath are particularly helpful for body stored trauma. Um, and I think that that can really help survivors regain a sense of calm, presence, um, awareness, and control over their bodies and their internal states. Um, I think touch can be a very powerful, obviously, I think touch can be a powerful tool in healing trauma. Um, that doesn't necessarily have to be a body worker. That can just be you hanging out with your body. Sometimes when I get to the end of a work day, if I have a little tension in my body, all I do is I'll just kind of, let's say I have tension in the side of my neck here. I'll just place a couple fingers with some firm pressure and I'll just take a few moments to drop into myself and I'll bring my breath really directly to that tissue. I try to kind of use my inhalation to access this space and then use my exhalation to soften it. So even just touching myself, I can create a little, little bit of change in my body. Um, you can also consider asking a loved one to help um, by just kind of holding or pressing gently in the areas of, of your body where you have pain. 
and that brings some of your awareness to it. As your awareness is brought, you can bring your breath and you can actually really successfully use that breath to create some change in that tension and to soften it a little bit. I'm not saying you're gonna be able to breathe all the trauma out of your body, <laughs> but when you're in that moment of crisis, I think it can be really useful. The combination of touch and breath can be really useful to help you just kind of drop down enough to be able to function a little bit. Uh, healthcare, so finding the right providers to help you. If you're struggling with uh, stored trauma in the form of GI issues, finding you know a naturopath or a doctor who can help you uh, eliminate other potential causes like food allergies, right? If you feel like you're really struggling with um, PTSD and flashbacks and dissociation, making an appointment with a qualified and trauma-informed therapist. And often I think the most powerful combination for people is working with a trauma-informed therapist and working with a trauma-informed body worker at the same time. I think that can be a really powerful combination. And then finally, uh, use your support system in your moment of crisis, right? Calling a supportive friend or loved one, talking to a family member, um, or calling a crisis line if you feel like there's not someone available in your vicinity that can hold the space that you need. Okay, let's... Um... Hey, Jason. Yeah. Lesbia, Lesbia had a question. Yeah. Uh, survivors can experience the same pain as when the abuse happened. So like whatever pain they experienced during that abuse, can, uh, is that the same pain? Um, I, yeah, I think it can absolutely be the same pain. And I think that's one of the things we were talking about earlier in terms of um, flashbacks being not really a memory, but more of a re-experiencing. And so I think often people can be triggered for any number of reasons and it can bring up the same feelings. So the fear and the anxiety, and it can also bring up all the physical sensations that occurred when that trauma initially took place. Um, I'll give you guys an example. A couple years ago, my, um, my mom was in a car accident with a deer. And to this day, this was probably five years ago, to this day, if I'm in the car with her and we pass one of those little yellow deer signs on a highway, her breath catches just a little bit. Like she has a little bit of a startle response just to seeing that deer sign because she's traumatized. And so every time she sees it, it reminds her. And, um, you know, in describing this to me, she told, it, she told me, and she's not really familiar with trauma or flashbacks or anything like that. Um, but she said, you know, I just keep getting an image of the moment I saw the deer's head come through the window. And every time I see that sign, it just pops into my head. And along with that, all of her crisis that she felt in that moment happens in her body, right? And so when it's sexual assault or any other form of violence or abuse, the same thing is, is happening. So I think absolutely it can bring up the same um, physical sensations. And I think one of the things that happens in body work when we release trauma is that that physical sensation is being brought up in a space that is safe. That sensation can be felt and it then can move through and out of the body and be released. Yeah, thank you for your question. Okay. So, you know what? We're pretty close to the end. So why don't we actually, instead of doing that breath exercise now, why don't we do our last few slides and then we can kind of wrap up with this nice little grounding breathing exercise. So how do we do this? How does the body release trauma? How does that happen? So in order for us to be able to release trauma, this is kind of the foundation that has to be set in order for that to be possible. So one, remember our way back at the beginning, our first definition of trauma is not having those internal and external resources to cope with this external threat, right? So in order for us to be at the point where we're ready to do some of this hands-on body work and release this stored trauma, that person needs to be in a place in their healing where they have the internal and external resources to handle the experience of those physical sensations and those feelings being brought up again. 
So they need those resources that were not in place when the experience first occurred. And that resourcing can mean, like I said at the beginning, a lot of different things. The other thing that's necessary is space for the traumatic energy to go when it's released. And so I mean that really in two ways. Uh, one, I mean that in the very like direct, literal, physical way, and I also mean it in the energetic woo way. So literally, when we are able to bring our breath to tissue, part of what's happening is we're expanding and literally creating more volume in the tissue. Um, and that's also a huge part of what we're doing with fascial release work is that we are releasing the fascia in a way that literally creates more volume in the tissue. Um, I worked on someone once whose tissue was so tight you would do a single stroke and you would see his leg then expand because his muscles under the fascia were so constricted and they were overdeveloped but extremely constricted. So as soon as you release the fascia, suddenly his leg would grow. Um, so we're literally with our fascial work, we're creating volume in the tissue, right? So we're literally creating physical space for that trauma to move out of the body. And then often what happens for people on the table when that release happens, there's this often this intense energetic release that comes with it. And that can be through breath, sweat, and body trembling. So it's, it's something that people often initially kind of shut down because they're afraid of it. But often if people can let that feeling come up, if they can let their body kind of tremble and shake, that's often part of the trauma release. And it's what allows it to kind of come up, move through and out of the body. And, uh, and I see my role as a provider in that situation. I allow myself to take some of that on in my body and I allow that to move through and out of my body as well. Um, and then the final piece is being able to reconnect the brain with the area of the body where trauma is stored. And when we do that, we're creating a new muscle memory of the tissue in its relaxed state. So this is kind of the foundation we need to set in order for the release of body stored trauma to be possible. Um, and so much of this is about bringing awareness, allowing that trauma to come up, allowing those difficult feelings and sensations to come up so they can move through and out of you. And I really like, again, what Bessel van der Kolk says about this, that being traumatized is not just an issue of being stuck in the past. It is just as much a problem of not being fully alive in the present. So I, um, Again, the theme of like the, the way through healing is through awareness, through bringing our awareness to the trauma we hold in our body so that we can release it. And that doing that enables us to be present and aware in our bodies and present and aware in our lives. What did I do? There we go. Okay, I'm gonna do it on time. All right, we're getting pretty close to the end, but I only have one or two more for you, so I think we're doing good. Um, so I'm gonna talk just a little bit more about the work that I do and about, I, you've probably heard me use terms like structural integration and myofascial work and fascial release. So let's talk just a little bit about what fascia is. I love this little picture over here of this person with their fascial sleeve because I feel like it really shows what fascia is. And so fascia is this connective tissue that wraps every single structure in your body. So it wraps every single muscle, um, and then it wraps groups of muscles, and it wraps all of your organs. And then on top of that, there is, like your skin, a layer of fascia around your entire body. So, so let me talk a little bit about how that works with groups of muscles. Let's say your, your quadriceps, that big thigh muscle on top of your leg. It's made up of four muscles. Each one has its own individual fascial wrapping, and then those four muscles together have a fascial wrapping that hold them all together. So what we're doing with our fascial work is we're releasing that connective tissue. And what happens in our body when we have an injury or a holding pattern, particularly if we have an acute injury, what the body does is it lays down all of these crisscross spider webby layers of fascia and connective tissue. Um, if you've ever been 
cutting, sorry for this example, if you're a vegetarian, but if you've ever been cutting chicken and you see that little thin membranous kind of tissue, translucent tissue between the skin and the meat, that's fascia, right? And so anytime we have an injury, our body lays down all of these layers of fascia and it creates stability and it limits range of motion while our body's healing from that injury. So again, really good in the short term, not so great in the long term because then long term we're immobilized in that area and we don't need to be, right? And so in our fascial work, sometimes we are working to move that fascia to a new location and sometimes we're working just to create a more uh, clear directionality in the fibers, right? So they're not this crisscross mashup, but that they all go in one direction so that you can smoothly recruit for movement. So, um, you know, if all the structures in my body were to disappear except my fascia, I would have a perfect J-shaped fascia structure. And so the idea of the structural integration work that I do, and particularly the 11 session series, is that we're going through that entire global web of fascia head to toe and releasing it in a really methodical way. Because what happens is, right, you get an injury. Let's say this person in our little picture has an injury on their left knee, right? And so you can see that there's this fascial pull being created at the left knee, but it doesn't just impact the knee, that pull comes up into the groin, it affects the hips, it affects down into the calf and the foot. And so anytime we have an injury or a shortening of fascia anywhere in our body, it creates pull somewhere else. And so the idea of this work is we're not just like rubbing where it hurts, we're kind of chasing down these lines of pull to treat the root cause of pain in the body and to eliminate it in a way that actually holds in the body instead of just, you know, kind of getting rubbed where it hurts and having it feel better for a day or two, but ultimately coming back to those uh, postural patterns or holding patterns that created the issue in the first place, right? So in structural integration work and myofascial work, we're really, you know, dialing in, locating and physically freeing restrictions in the muscle and the surrounding fascia that house traumatic memory. And so that's kind of what I was trying to describe in the, that, that we're literally creating this volume in the tissue. And again, just coming back to bringing awareness and, and it sounds like oversimplified, but that's really, it is that simple as, as bringing awareness to those areas. So the first step um, for me is simply making contact and helping that person bring their awareness to the tension in the area we're working on. And dissociation is so powerful that we're often unaware of the specific tensions in our body. You know, I can't count the number of times I've landed on a really tight spot and someone has gone, oh, I had no idea that was there until you touched it, right? And again, it's not just me doing something with my hands, it's really us collaborating and meeting in the middle. So they're focusing their breath to soften tension internally and as they're doing that, I'm moving the tissue externally in tandem with their breath. And I'm waiting and feeling for the nervous system to be ready, right? Because what we know about the freeze response is that that person might be unable to articulate the no that they're feeling in the moment that they freeze. So I'm always waiting like consent is not just in body work, this verbal conversation. It's also paying attention with my hands and with what I'm observing to that person's nervous system and waiting, not just for permission from them, but kind of wait, like waiting for this consent and permission from their nervous system before we create some movement with that work. So as we kind of go through, I think of it as kind of an unraveling of that fascial system layer by layer. So as we go through and we unravel those restrictions, traumatic surface or traumatic memory can surface and release for people, which is what causes that kind of shaking, trembling, um, different spontaneous body movements. Um, and the work I do and the work I'm really excited to be sharing with trauma survivors is that neuromuscular integration series and it addresses the entire fascial web head to toe over the course of 11 sessions. Um, and I realize it's 1130. Is it okay if, that we're going a few minutes past? <laughs>
Okay. Um, okay, I think this one is actually pretty self-explanatory, so I'm just gonna go ahead and let you guys take that. This is just a series of questions that you can ask to a potential provider. Um, and then based on their answers, you can make an informed decision about whether that person is a good fit for you or not. This is uh, also the handout that will be- This is also on the handout, thank you. Um, okay, well, let's go ahead and do that breathing exercise. And then I have a few resources and quotes to leave you guys with. Um, then I'll take any questions and then we'll wrap up. So let's do some breathing. <laughs> So what I want you guys to, to think about for this is breathing into three different chambers in your torso. So I'm going to kind of describe this and then we can all do it together. And so I'm going to stand and I like this exercise because it's really accessible. You can do it in any position. You can do it sitting or standing. You can do it while you're in a meeting with all your coworkers or a Zoom meeting. Um, all right, so the first chamber we're going to think about, I guess I need to make it so you can see me a little better. Okay, so the first chamber we're going to talk about is down here, this space between the pelvic floor and the diaphragm. So kind of picture your pelvic floor as a bowl. And the first part of our breath work is going to be bringing breath down the spine and into that pelvic floor and really filling this first chamber of space between the pelvic floor and the diaphragm, which is at the base of your rib cage. Okay. The next chamber is going to be the diaphragm and the lower ribs. So kind of the space from the base of your rib cage to the sternum. So next you're going to fill that. And then finally, the last place you're going to fill, and you kind of want to fill each chamber completely before you let air move to the next one. Final chamber you're going to fill is the sternum, chest, and upper ribs. So as we do this and we breathe up into this space in the body, the spine is going to extend and you're going to get a little space in your vertebrae and you're probably going to get a little taller. So what I want you to think about as you exhale is letting your body soften, but keeping just a little bit of firmness in your core to hold that new height, to hold the spinal extension that we're gonna achieve through this breathing exercise. Does that make sense? Cool. I'm gonna let Michelle speak for all of you since it makes sense to her. <laughs> um, okay, so you're gonna start nice deep breath in through your nose. Fill the chamber from your pelvic floor up to your diaphragm and then let that breath move from your diaphragm, filling your lungs and the base of your ribs, letting it move up into your sternum and letting your lungs fill, letting your rib cage expand. And then as you exhale, letting your core firm up just a little bit to hold that new height and that extension of your breath. And I know folks are probably having to leave because we pushed a, a little past 1130. So I had a little more I was gonna do with you for that. Nah, I will, I'll go ahead and do it for those of you who are still hanging out. So I'm gonna give you a little more information and a visual and we're gonna try that one more time. So here's a lovely picture of your beautiful, beautiful lungs and rib cage. And what I want you to picture um, is your diaphragm kind of right there at the base of the ribs. Your diaphragm's right here. And it has this kind of funny shape. It's basically shaped like kind of an umbrella or a mushroom cap. And when you inhale, what this muscle does is it flattens out and it pushes the base of your rib cage and opens it laterally. So it should kind of open like that, like a fireplace bellows. So bring that image into your mind of your diaphragm flattening out and pushing the bottom of your rib cage out laterally to open it. And then as you continue your breath up those three chambers, filling the entire rib cage expand three dimensionally. So feeling that lateral opening at the base, feeling the lift of the sternum and feeling your lungs inflate to fill that space that's created by your diaphragm opening up. 
Does that make sense? Cool. Here we go. One more time with that visual of the diaphragm and the rib cage, bringing breath into those three chambers. Filling first from the pelvic floor to the diaphragm, then from the diaphragm up into the sternum and the chest, letting all of this space open. As you exhale, letting your shoulders drop, letting your body be soft, but still strong through the core to hold that new height. There are a million different breathing exercises and ways to um, release trauma in your body through breath. Um, I think this is a really nice just general um, breathing exercise to help open the front of the body, extend the spine, and help you kind of relax and drop into the parasympathetic. I think there are a lot of specific breath work that you can do into specific areas of trauma and I will just go ahead and let that go since we're running short on time. So moving on, here are all the resources I used in this presentation and some that I didn't use. I wanted to highlight just really quick a couple of them. Um, I really love this resource. Uh, the Body Keeps Score is a really wonderful uh, book about trauma stored in the body. Um, this I think is probably my favorite and is the most beautiful workbook um, for survivors of sexual assault. It's called The Art to Healing from Sexual Trauma. I didn't really use it for this presentation, but it's just a really beautiful, wonderful workbook for survivors. And it's written by a massage therapist. And it has a ton of stuff that kind of coming back to the way we store memories in, um, in nonverbal ways. This has so much uh, self-work for people to address um, their survivorship and their trauma through ways other than just kind of the retelling of our stories. So these are two of my favorite books. I think Michelle held up uh, Waking the Tiger, which I didn't actually put on here. I, put, uh, I did put in another Peter Levine book uh, in an unspoken voice, How the Body Releases Trauma and Restores Goodness. Um, and then sort of connected to Peter Levine down here at the bottom, I have the link for the channel for the National Institute for the Clinical Application of Behavioral Medicine. And that place is a treasure trove of videos about trauma theory and the neurobiology of trauma. And um, there's a ton of, there's a number of interviews with Peter Levine on there that have been really informative for me. So that's a great place to go for more information. Um, and then I also wanted to highlight Again, I didn't really use this in the presentation, but I think it's really useful. Um, the second article down, How Body Work Helped Me Find Healing from Trauma, um, I think that gives a lot of good information about the intersections of trauma and race and healing. And it's also just a really beautifully written piece about this woman's um, experience accessing body work to help her heal from trauma. Um, and she writes a lot about her identity as a black woman and intersections between that and her trauma experience and her body work experiences. So I think that's a really valuable one as well. Um, and finally, I wanna leave you guys with three quotes. Uh, the first one from Maya Angelou, there's no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside of you. The next from Peter Levine, Trauma is not what happens to us, but what we hold inside in the absence of an empathetic witness. And I really love those first two because they speak to what I feel our job is and what our role is as advocates and what my role is as a body worker. I feel like at the base of all of my work is holding space and being a witness to the trauma that other people have and how valuable it's been in my own life to be able to release trauma and have a witness to that experience and how affirming that has been for me. And finally, from Helen Keller, although the world is full of suffering, it is also full of the overcoming of it. And I think all of this information, the fact that we have the tools within ourselves to heal our bodies um, is something that gives me a lot of hope. <laughs> um, 
for what we can do and what we can accomplish in our lifetimes and in this movement. And that's all I have for you guys. Thank you so much for being here. It's been really fun to share all this info with you. Mm -hmm. The end. Yeah. Um, I, uh, if you have, if you want to stick around and ask a couple questions of Jace, we can hang around for another five mm -hmm. minutes. Um, but also know that um, this will, this is recorded so you can access it later. <laughs> Um, as well as um, everybody who is on this today is going to receive an email afterwards with the handouts, with the copy of this PowerPoint, uh, and a link to an evaluation that I would really appreciate it if you would fill out. Um, and that will come later. So thank you so much. And um, I'll, I'm opening the Q&A, so feel free to ask any questions. Um, you know, in this kind of last five minutes. And if not, you can just take off and do your day. Yeah. And you're welcome if you have to take off right now, but this is something you want to keep talking about or you have more questions about it. Um, my email's on here and you're more than welcome to shoot me a message and get in touch with me. Um, I love talking about this stuff. I'm just, um, uh, I became a parent a few years ago, so I've taken a long break from training and um, trauma work outside of my private practice. And I'm just kind of uh, dipping my toe back into doing some training work again and expanding um, some of my professional work after uh, being home with a little kid the last few years. So thanks for kind of giving me the opportunity.